If you're anything like me at the moment, you need some encouragement. And I know I certainly do. After today, watching more great numbers come out for Victoria and even greater numbers for New South Wales, I've been of late finding it difficult to get on with it, to get on with things. And it was this subject of the protesters that got me thinking during the week about how people have endured for the truth, for the preservation of the truth and the lengths that they've gone to at times giving their own lives so that we might have what we've got in front of us. And I got thinking about that and it caused me to start thinking about do I celebrate what I have? Right now we have a culture and and our environment, particularly over the last 18 months, has been very much focused on what we don't have and what we can't do. So if you're anything like me, you might read the papers and tune into the TV or on your phone, and what we're waiting to hear at 11 o'clock every day is the things we can't do and the places we can't go and the people we can't see. And eventually that way of thinking will wear off on all of us, won't it? And I certainly know it has for me. So I started thinking just a few days ago about the things that I do have. And because the subject is is around, I guess, the, the protesters and those that have given up so much, I thought, well, what I do have must be directly related to the sacrifice of people that have gone before me. So I thought tonight, we're going to open with a few minutes just in James to, to, to seat our subject. And then we're going to look at two examples, brothers and sisters, in modern history of people, much like the protesters, that have sacrificed their everything so that we today might have the truth. One that is no longer um, alive and one that is very much alive. And we'll uh, have a look at that and we might pull some lessons out of it and see if we can get some encouragement and put some focus and perspective on what we do have as opposed to what we don't because these are such difficult times. But as always, it's good for us to clarify, isn't it, why we're even in this mess in the first place. And now none of us truly know, I guess, from a, from a global pandemic perspective why we're here. But we do know that through words like are recorded in James, we understand what it's all about. We're going to skip over just a few verses here in James chapter 1 and just remind ourselves and recalibrate what it is that God's trying to do for us. These are words, if you're anything like me, again, that I know so well. I can trot them out, no problem. But when moments come along like this for me and I start to struggle with just everything that's going on, I start reading these just slightly differently. Look in verse 2 of James chapter 1. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. We've all heard that before. We know that verse and a lot of these verses off the top of our head without even thinking. Count it all joy. That word means cheerfulness. You be cheerful about falling into diverse temptations. James picks up the same language that the Lord Jesus Christ used in the parable of the Good Samaritan when a certain man went on a journey and fell amongst thieves. It's the same words, the same language. And look how that ended for him. He was beaten within an inch of his life. Had nothing happened, he would have died. Is that not typical of our state prior to meeting the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet he was meant to be happy about it. James says, you be cheerful about when these things come along. He says, I'll tell you why you should be cheerful. In verse 3, he says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. I know that verse really well as well. But there's a key, couple of key phrases there, a couple of key words. Verse 3, knowing. Number one, he says, you've got to know why this is happening. You've got to know why you're under so much pressure at the moment, whether it be the man falling amongst thieves or, or um, whether it be us with our, with our global pandemic sweeping the world, we can't be certain for every detail, but we've got to understand from God's perspective what these things are going to be teaching us. He says, know this, that the trying of your faith, know this about the experience you're about to have 
The trying of your faith works patience. The trying of your faith. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 11 to 15 goes to great lengths to tell us that faith is tested by time. And this thing's been 18 months long and we've all had enough of it. And it goes longer, doesn't it? And it's starting to test our faith. It's starting to test us as a meeting and as a body, as a group, brothers and sisters. I spoke to my dad the other day who is in Adelaide, he's 74, I think, or 73. He's been a Christadelphian for 45 years and he said he has never seen the strain on the Brotherhood and Christadelphia Australia-wide like it is right now. He, he can't quite believe it. The trying of our faith, our faith being tested by time, as stated in Hebrews 6, what is it for? Well, it works patience. The word means to endure. It's going to get us through it. And it says in verse 4, he says, well, but let patience have her perfect work that you might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, that you might be whole and entire. So why is this happening? First, we've got to know that God is in and around and working with us during these um, difficult times. He's working in us with these difficult times. He's using them and working them. And that this trial, as long as it goes, the longer it goes, the more accurate measurement of our faith he will ascertain, won't he? And why is it that he's doing it? What's his purpose? What is God's why? Well, it's to make you whole and entire. He says, I'll do such a good job of it, you won't want anything else. Well, we think, well, that's all great in theory. We all know that too. But how on earth are we going to do this? Well, he covers that in the next few verses. If anyone wants to understand or if any of you lack wisdom, just ask me. Just ask me because I tell you who I am. I'm the one that gives to all men and all women and all brothers and all sisters and all young people and our children liberally if we ask in faith. Don't waver when you ask me. If you want to understand what's going on, ask me. If you want help getting through it, then you need to ask me because I know what I'm doing. I'm putting you through a process that's going to make you whole and entire and you're not going to want to think. And as hard as it is, I need you to ask me. And, of course, we know what happens at the end of the section that we read tonight. But we'll save that for the end of our talk together. So we take those words and we, and we think about what it means to endure trial. And we're all enduring at the moment. And like I stated before, I find myself forgetting the things I do have and concentrating on the things that I don't. But there's a lot of people that have gone before me and before you that have, that have lived extraordinary lives to afford us the opportunity to count the blessings we do have in the middle of our trial. And we're going to consider just a couple of them tonight. There's a lot of faithful people that have gone and given up so much for the benefit of so many people. So I'd like to just put some perspective, and, and I'm going to take a few thoughts tonight from a couple of books. I have one of them with me and the other one I don't. It's online and I'm happy to share a link afterwards. But the first one I'm going to talk um, off of the back of is that. Conscience in Action. I'm not sure if anyone knows this book. It's a really, really good book. Read it in sections, but it is, it is really, really well put together. It comes with a CD in the back of it as well, so you can actually listen to it if you've got a CD player. You can listen to it, uh, but it's, a, it's an excellent book. And we're going to take a few thoughts out of this um, and, and consider uh, one person that's noted in that book and another person um, that, is, that actually lives overseas who I'll introduce you to later. But when it comes to, down to trial, let, we're going to consider people that stood for the truth and through their lives and their work 
just in that small measure and small way, it has impacted us today. So they went through a trial and we now at the moment have our present trial. And I find myself doing this for me, for, to, to put myself into perspective once again and, 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 and say stop and think. And that's why little exercises like this are really, really helpful. So if you were to consider perhaps someone that lived 80 or 100 years ago that had to stand up for what they believed and endure their trial that they were going through and stand up for the things of the truth, well, often the first thing, for example, when we take people like conscientious objectors, when we take them and they stand up, one of the first things they experienced was loss of work. Their employers just gave them the boot, wasn't it? And, and so that's on one hand. If on the other hand we think about our present trial, well, guess what? We all work from home now. We've had a global pandemic coming through. We're, we're quite fortunate that 65% of the ecclesia hasn't just suddenly lost their jobs and we're scrambling around emptying the ecclesial bank accounts or putting out fundraisers to try and feed everyone. By and large, God has blessed us that most people can now move in and work from home. So we've got a bit, bit of a leg up in, that, in our trial, don't we? As painful as it can be at times. You see, these other, these other people that have gone before us, quite often when they stood up for their trials, they, they, they were ostracised by the community. So the government would close in on these people and as the government closed in, all their friends left. They were left without friends, ostracised by the whole community around them. They were left in isolation. And you see, as much as we're struggling with our present trial, the bottom line is this. We, we've really had in and of itself probably two uh, interactions together removed from our, uh, our, our weekly calendars, haven't we? Maybe perhaps Sunday morning and Wednesday night, if we were to average it out, two and a half or three hours has been removed. But really our whole social existence is still there because it's online. It's still there as much as we're in isolation. It's just whether we choose to see what we have or what we don't have. See, unlike the others, they didn't have online. They had no friends because of their trial. They too were often publicly shamed in the news, whether it was stood in the streets written up on billboards, published on the front pages and sent out for everyone to read their name and their address and their family name and make that great association with someone that won't fight for their country, that won't carry on the good work, publicly shamed. You know what, brothers and sisters, this world barely even knows we're here. They barely even know we're here, do they, in the middle of our trial. They've got bigger things to worry about than the Christadelphians. Ultimately, this, le this life of people gone before us, of faith, would end with them being put on trial. They would have to stand up. We're going to see one of these people. They would have to stand up and give account for their life and be put on trial in the court of law. The closest we come to that was about two months ago, wasn't it, when your local government sent around a ballot paper and you scribbled on the back, I'm a Christadelphian, you're going to deal with it, and you posted it back. That's as close as we come to standing up in the court of law at the moment in our present trial to give an account for what we believe. And ultimately, some even paid the greatest price for making a stand and protesting, didn't they? And we're struggling at the moment, and I certainly am, as this disease grips the world. Do you know that, that perspective of making that ultimate price and paying that ultimate price was brought home yesterday afternoon when I spoke with um, Brother Graham Reeve. Not sure if you saw that uh, Brother Graham put out on What's On uh, an email that reported that two brethren had 
passed away in Afghanistan. They were caught up in the bombings in Kabul. And Brother Graham was exceptionally upset as he told the story of what happened. And it's all in very limited um, detail with uh, no names or anything like that because it can't be um, disclosed. But sadly tonight, well, I guess whatever time it is over there, right now at the moment there are two families without um, fathers. And they both went to the airport to try and to... Um, gained tickets for their families and were caught up in, obviously, the violence that has happened there. It's just so incredibly sad, isn't it, that everywhere we look, there's so many different things that are coming upon our community. And so I thought we would have a quick look at our first example. I'm just going to take you through one example that we're going to pull out of the Conscience in Action book first. And I just want you to hear this individual story and just, uh, if you're anything like me, these things impact me because I think, well, there's so many that have gone, that have done an incredible job at professing their beliefs that allow us to be in the position we are today in the middle of our trial. And his name uh, is Albert Mertz. Now, to begin with, the truth in Germany in the late 1800s was introduced by a man by the name of Albert Meyer. And uh, the Lampstand actually has a very good article on him. Volume 19 has a very good article on his life. But he travelled from Germany to America as a young man and he heard the truth there. At a small gathering he went to, he heard the truth, spoke in German, there was a German brother there that translated everything that was being said. And so he learned the um, principles of the truth there and he went back to Germany to start preaching. And this is in the late 1800s. And he preached for a good few years and he had very little success. You imagine having, to, having that task to go back into your own country and to your knowledge, there's no one else that thinks like you, to your knowledge. And so you set about trying to preach the gospel in the late 1800s in Germany by yourself in your late 20s. Quite an amazing uh, young man he was, but he had little success. In fact, he had two converts only, one of which would later migrate to Birmingham. So with the, with, with the lack of success, he's not perturbed. What he does is he sells his home that he bought and he moves to America with his mum. And there he attends meetings and gets gains a stronger knowledge and understanding of the, of the things of God and of the gospel. And sadly, his mum passes away, so he decides to move back to Germany. But this time, what he does is he takes as many resources as he can and among the books and the, and the uh, documents he takes, he takes many of the works of John Thomas and Robert Roberts with him. When he gets back to Germany, he starts uh, a small meeting and that, with God's blessing, begins to grow and he, and he even goes as far as to convert a small uh, local parish or church or whatever it would be called then and he rebaptizes a few of them as well and in amongst all of the growth that they experienced, there was a family named the Mertz family, and they learned the truth. And Mum and Dad Mertz, they had three brothers. I'm just going to, there we go. Um, some of these photos too, there's no actual photos that I could ascertain of the family, but certainly these are of similar eras um, that Google has kindly provided us. So mum and dad uh, learn the truth and they have three boys. They have August, they have Rudolf, and they have Albert. And, of course, now this is in the mid to late 20s, our period of time. Germany is in trouble. The Nazi party was growing stronger, wasn't it? And so is the hatred for not only the Jews but all those that would support pro-Jewish views. And the Christadelphians, or the Ur-Christen, as they were called, caught the Nazi attention, the Nazi uh, party attention in around 1933. 
And of course, they, they, the, the grip tightened, didn't it, across all of the government as they became stronger and stronger in power. And then the first brother of the uh, Mertz family, August, was arrested in 1938. And he would have been sent something, as is depicted here on the screen, he, he was sent to a Nazi concentration camp for six years. Do you know, he was arrested for what he believed and he was sent to a place like that for six years and he survived. That was the first brother. It wasn't long until Rudolf, the second brother, was also arrested and he was sent to a, an insane asylum for his beliefs. And one commentator makes the, the, the note that as the government and different um, levels of the judicial system changed as Europe unfolded with Nazi Germany, so would the uh, punishments that were handed out to these people. They would change as well. So they seemed to get more and more severe as time went on. So for young Rudolf, he went into an insane asylum of which he survived as well. There is a picture of a well-known one at that period of time. And you imagine what that would have been like to be put in a place like that when you're completely not sane and you're put among those that are declared insane for what you believe. And finally, Albert is called for military service in 1941. And refusing to serve like his brothers before him, he was imprisoned in the Brandenburg Gordon Prison. And he was put on trial. There is a picture of, uh, I'm not sure who it is, but there is a picture of the People's Court at around that time. And you would have to stand there and give evidence like that of your own case. And so they tried him. And in the book, there is a section in here which gives you what they actually said to him. And I'm going to read it now because I find it absolutely fascinating. It says this, <clears throat> speaking to Albert, the prosecution says, you will remember that the judge read to you the word in the Bible literally where it said that everybody has to be subject to authorities and those authorities are instituted by God. If you personally always say that the Bible is competent for you, then you must let pass this Bible word against your conception too. You were not, to, you were not able to answer this Bible word with, single, with a single word. If an authority such as the Fuhrer calls upon the German nation to defend itself, if necessary with the sword, in the fight against the intended assaults of its neighbours, and if he, as authority, introduced universal military service, then it means, according to the, um, the mentioned Bible words that you have spoken, it is approved by God and you have to obey it. That's what they said to him. And, of course, he gave no answer for it, except the fact that he rejected their statements. It was only he was arrested in early 1941 and on the 23rd of February he wrote a letter which has been published and he wrote this to his family. He said this, I write, I find it hard to write to you today, not for my own sake, but rather as that I know this letter will bring you much grief. Therefore, I want to ask you not to take it too hard. You know my faith and my hope. Christ is my life and to die is my profit. And do not cry on account of me, even if I have to suffer the worst. Be firm and, and compose yourself. When my time is ended and I have to part, I want you to remember that man is destined to die and afterwards to undergo judgment. Tomorrow I shall file a petition for pardon. Perhaps the court will have mercy on me. And 
If not, I still hope to get permission to write to you once again. Include me in your prayers. I want to come to a close now, trusting in God and his kingdom, and I send you my love. And less than three weeks later, early on the morning of the 4th of April, 1941, Albert was executed for what he believed. It's quite a fascinating and unbelievable story, isn't it, brothers and sisters? He was executed for what he stood up for and believed. And I take that sort of a story, just that little snippet, and I sit and I try now to weigh that against the trial and the circumstances we find ourselves in. And it gives a great perspective, doesn't it? A very great perspective indeed. There are many stories like that in this book. I would encourage as many people as uh, possible to certainly have a read. The other person that we're going to consider, we've actually got um, a short documentary on. When we had the pleasure of living in South Africa, we met a man by the name of Ronnie Van Roon. And Ronnie is a good friend uh, and his wife, Yvette, and their family are very good friends of ours and particularly also brother Charlie Taylor. And Ronnie is a champion right from the word go. When I met him, I found him quite a, an unbelievable guy. He's a very quiet guy, quietly spoken. But he has a fierce determination and he would tell me the story later on and he very quickly worked out where it came from. But before we get there, his work over in South Africa uh, has been unbelievable, really. He had, was instrumental in beginning the Lamontville Ecclesia over there up in the, the townships, one of the first township ecclesias that appeared. And that appeared long before any of the others, and it was largely due to he and Yvette's work. And they would go into those townships uh, back in the apartheid era as well, not just in the um, newer uh, South African government, but back in apartheid, late 80s and early 90s, they would go and they would work in these areas which were deemed highly dangerous. And Brother Ronnie did an incredible work in there with his family, and that ecclesia is the largest now of the township ecclesias. But, see, he never grew up a Christadelphian. In fact, he was um, actually part of their, their family, were Af part of one of the um, very strict Afrikaans uh, Orthodox churches there, and that's how he grew up. And, and he had very, very strict and proud parents. And it was at about 18 years old that he found the Christadelphians. And I won't say too much more of his story. We're going to watch it at the end. It goes for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, we were lucky enough to make the documentary when we lived there. Um, I think you'll find it very interesting. So we're going to close with uh, Ronnie's story, which we're going to see um, in a few moments. <clears throat> But just to wrap what I'm saying up before we watch that, <clears throat> let's just consider what our message that we're trying to get through tonight for us all is tonight. The message is let's endure this trial. I don't say that like I'm actually able to do this by myself. I'm not. I know I need other people around me to help me endure this trial and I'm fairly certain you're the same. If we know and understand that God is involved in this somehow, even though we might not have the full clarity, and we know what the outcome is, that it's to make us entire and to make us whole, and that we know if we are struggling on the way, he's even given us the direct line on how to deal with it, well, I think we can. It's hard to see these things at the moment, isn't it? It's hard to see them with COVID, with the numbers increasing, and everything else that's going on, and the, the young people have... No interaction, their conferences are moved. Let's embrace and celebrate and thank God for what we do have, <clears throat> for what we do have in the middle of our trial and what we have in so many ways is related to people like we heard of tonight that made that stand, not only in that period of time, but right through the ages that have stood up for what they believe. And it's with, with their sacrifice and their example that we're able to have. So think of what we do have. <clears throat> we do have freedom of speech, don't we? 
we're lucky enough to just be able to, even, even if it is online, talk about anything that we want and express our, our views and our, and our religious views and spread them in proactively to other people. We're allowed to do that. They don't have that freedom of speech almost anywhere else in the world. We've got it here. We've got great communications. You know, in speaking to Brother Graham last night, he said the only thing that is still up and running and left, and some a semblance of normality left in Afghanistan for those brothers and sisters is the fact that there's still internet communication. We can't send money because there's no banks open to send money to. The whole thing it seems to be, doesn't it, from outside, falling apart, and yet we have great communications as we're experiencing here tonight. We have great resources, don't we? <clears throat> we have libraries full. Now, we might not go and use a library or books like this. We can get that online, though. You can get all sorts of things online. We have great resources, not only Christadelphian works, not only all the pioneer works, which is so integral in the fact that we sit here today, but there are other Christian writers that can, that can uh, equally bolster us through and, and help us endure this difficult process. Wasn't that the first thing that that young pioneer and that ecclesia in Germany brought back? But as much help as he could get, we're swimming in resources. We've just got to go and open them up. We've got friends and support, don't we? <clears throat> and we do, just because we can't see each other and we lose 120 minutes worth of interaction a week doesn't mean that our friends just fall off the face of the earth. And I remind myself of this, I must remind myself of this often. If any of you, and there's probably about six of the fellas out there laughing their heads off, if you've ever tried to ring me, I don't ring back. And I've got to make more of an effort than that. I've got to remember that my friends are out there and I've got to support them. We're lucky that we've got careers that can be put online. You imagine, as we said at the beginning, if we had more than half the ecclesia without the ability to work, but we can. Inside of what we're going through now, we actually have a great challenge, and that is an opportunity. In front of us is the opportunity to discover new ways for us to worship and fellowship not to change doctrine, not to change things for the sake of changing them or, or do things differently. This is because our environment around us is changing, is it not? Now there's a great challenge for us as an ecclesia to discover new ways on how to be effective with our young people. If this does not let up for another 12 months, do we sit and just wait for it to roll by or do we get proactive and think of these ways? and embrace the challenge and grab our talents while the master is away and multiply those talents no matter how difficult it is because all the while we're being made whole and entire and we're learning to endure and to be patient. There's a great challenge there for us to take up and, of course, we've got a hope, don't we? Just imagine. Imagine sitting in this world right now without a hope, without the hope of an, a coming king, the one that we look for, don't we? We look for the kingdom, don't we? We look to see our future king come and set up on the earth. And for us, we're so excited by that because it means eternal life. That's what we're excited about. Imagine dealing with this, what they're dealing with there, with no hope. I hope's what we've got. And what does it bring? Well, we said, James chapter 1 and verse 12, blessed is the man and the woman and the brother and the sister and the young person that endure the temptation. For when they are tried, they will receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let's, uh, brothers and sisters, I invite you to watch this little short documentary on Ronnie.
So as a young man when I was in high school, so that's from about 13 to 18 years old, we were already preparing for uh, our military training. So at school, you would do marching and they would start preparing, especially the, the men. At 16 years of age, you get your call up and then a lot, the, the next year you do your, your matric year where you matriculate and then thereafter you get called up if you don't go to university. So the young men at high school were quite prepared. Everybody looked forward to it. It was something to look forward to. It was, uh, friends tried to stay together, friends asking one another where we're going, which camp are you being called up to. So uh, there was just great excitement in terms of going to serve your country and protecting your family. So it was always, it always came back to protecting your family. Uh, are you doing the right thing? Are you going to protect your family against this, this, this um, Russian communistic onslaught? So it was, it was a thing that you felt as a young man, it was your honor, it was uh, your duty. And it was also the church, when you go to church on Sunday, the minister in church would also um, have a message where you are doing God's duty. You are protecting uh, the Christians against these non-believers. So there was this great sense of, of being part of something much bigger than yourself. And to now stand up against that, was quite a thing so you had to have something a different voice speaking something differently and I think that's where when I met the Christadelphians where that voice came through very strongly so before that I mean you would question maybe um, the sense of all of us but I mean are we the enemy what if the enemy is Christian but because the church and the government was so strong in their voice it was very difficult to to take that further and have a, a, a much deeper debate but when I met the Christadelphians, uh, I heard this different voice and suddenly you realized uh, potentially that there, 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 there may be some alternatives. Maybe I can stand up. Maybe I can question this, this Goliath of, of a government and be like a David and try and follow a different way that shows that, you know, we are all Christian um, and there should be, you know, love should conquer evil rather. So in South Africa, there was obviously, I mean, we, uh, there was relative peace, but there was a lot of unrest in the townships. Some of that unrest uh, spilled over into the cities where we would have a car bomb exploding. So we knew our, 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 our government and our people were under attack. And again, so that just drove that same message back home again, that every young guy has to, it's your duty, you have to do it if we all stand together. And I think you must understand, this is a big message in the culture of the South African. Unity makes strength. We, you know, it's, a, it's where we come from, from the time we moved, we left the Cape and we moved up to, uh, to the north and we had to stand against the English, against uh, the Zulus and the Tosas. It was that we were a small group as a nation, but together we succeeded and conquered great odds. This is still there today. So. Imagine now if you, you're part of a small band of people and you now suddenly stand out of that, that group and say, no, I'm not doing what you're all doing. I'm, I'm going to break ranks. Uh, I mean, people immediately perceive you as a traitor. You're letting the team down because now the team's weaker. So it, 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 it was not an easy thing to do. And I think the evidence of that is that if you look at our history, I mean, you can count on one hand how many people in Christadelphia alone stood up and said, we are, we are going to follow a different path. Not many people um, had, had that courage. And it's, if I really look back in honesty, it's not so much about courage because you, you, you kind of sense you need to do something different, but you know you're facing, the, I come back to this image of Goliath, you're facing a Goliath. And at the end of the day, you, it's like you, 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 you say, I'm in man's world and I want to move across to God's world. But that crossing over is so, so dangerous. It's like a hanging bridge that you've got to cross over and you're looking at this bridge and you, you know it's basically impossible. The bridge is, it doesn't have enough support. How are you going to get to the other side? So and I think that's why a lot of young men, if I could use that analogy, why a lot of young men just decided to stay on, on, on man's side and just not cross over. 
uh, because you, you looked at it and you said, logically, I can't do it. How can one person stand up against a government? Where's my strength? What, what am I going to use to, to withstand and fight this government? I've got nothing. But it's once you take that first step and you do it in fear, so you are ashamed in the beginning. You're ashamed of what you're going to do because you get an immediate response from people uh, treating you like a traitor, treating you like an outcast. But as you take that first step, amazing things just start happening. You, you start realizing that uh, it's like an infant taking that first step and they want to walk. You just get this feeling that God and the angels and Jesus are right around you. They're watching every step. They, if you're going to stumble, they'll catch you. And, 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 and if you, I mean, the story of what I went through in my most weakest time, that's when I really sensed the most powerful part of God. So when man looked at me and said, Ronnie has now left, left us, he's totally weak, he's totally on his own. I didn't feel that from God's point of view. I suddenly felt I've never been so close to God. I've never sensed the power of God as much when I was at my most vulnerable. I'd studied for about 10 months and then uh, it was, again, there's a, there was a lot of you, a young man, and there's not a lot of room to make all these decisions. You don't have the luxury if you, um, you know, if you're on the other side to uh, study and to make decisions. So everything happens very, happens very quickly. So I'd met um, the Christadelphians and I started studying with them and I started seeing that the other, there's another way to do this. And I had to make decisions very quickly because you get called up when you're 18 years old and, and the government in a sense, because it was national conscription and they had limited uh, numbers, they had to make sure that they made those numbers every year that they get these young men to in fact do service. So they would in a sense hunt you down. So I knew I had very little time to make a decision. So you it's just yeah everything if you're looking back you think how did you do it but you it's like again god working and you um you know you i think you you get the message but it's that courage is to get that that courage to do it because you hear stories and you must remember with me i had another brother that had gone before me everett pool and by the time and it was my time to go pretty released so um he was really at least so now we had heard all the stories he had gone through and those stories uh, when you sat around the fire or you were just chatting at night those stories there were some good stories but most of the stories filled you with fear because you would ask yourself am i brave enough am i spiritually strong enough to go through that because you you know you you're going to be isolated you'll be away from family uh, you'll basically be in, in, a, in, a, in a prison uh, environment am i strong enough to to cope with all of that, can I cope? What are people going to do with me while I'm there? So you're so full of, you know, all of those things, those thoughts come into your head that you, 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 you're looking for courage from God, but you, um, you, I think before you go, you doubt yourself tremendously. no matter what it what it involves in life but once you make the decision things change it's it's when we don't make that decision and this was no different uh, while you're pondering what am i going to do uh, there's lots of uncertainty lots of fear lots of doubt in in, in, in your god but once you come to a point uh, and where you make that decision and, and unfortunately for me, that process to make my decision, I, I was a bit like Jonah, I ran away. I doubted myself so much that if I look back, I ran away from this decision. But like Jonah, I could, only, I could never run away from God. You can never run away from this. I, I got to a point where I had to make the decision. And once I made it, um, it was just incredible how God just started walking with me. And, and these aren't great stories. These are simple stories. It's a story, to give an example, when I was, uh, the day I was uh, 
admitted into the detention or prison. As you get to that waiting room, they ask you to get undressed and you're only in, 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 in your underrods. So you take off all your clothes and all your, your, your belongings get separated from you and you stand there basically naked in front of uh, these military officials. And so now you're at your weakest. I mean, if you get undressed and you stand in front of people, you really feel exposed and weak. And at that stage, I was now doubting, was this the right decision? What's going to happen? This is day one, and here I'm standing totally stark in front of these military people. And there on the side was my Bible in a Bible case. And one military um, official saw the Bible. Now, that's an arbitrary object. And he said, but that, that Bible looks like Everett Poole's Bible. Are you not by chance uh, a brother of Everett Poole? Now, who would have thought in, in that weak moment something like that would have happened, that uh, this hardened military official would suddenly remember Everett Poole's name, a former Christadelphian, and by me associating myself with him, everything changed. So that's how God works. So that, that was my first lesson when I went to prison, is that God is everywhere. God's in the minds of your very enemy. And, um, and, and, and it's just simple things that changes everything around. And, and so from that day I realized God will look after me. And that's how you then become courageous. You, and you, you develop a sense where you're not ashamed. And you're not ashamed because you know what God's with you. What this experience has given me, and it happened uh, probably over 40 years ago, uh, and, I, and it stayed with me, it's like my foundation. So I, I know, I don't fear death, I don't fear whatever man can bring on me. I've been there and, I, and I've seen how God works. And uh, once, you, once you taste uh, you know, God in that situation, you're not ashamed. You know, you, you've got this inner strength. Uh, that, that never gets taken away. And it's strange, I never forget it. I never forget those lessons and how, um, you know, how, how God was there. And you go through uh, difficult times in your life, but you always, that, you, you hit that rock bottom part in your life. And at, at that level, there was God. So you, you, you have this quiet inner you know, strength, you know, right at that rock bottom stage of my life, there God, God will be there. He'll be waiting for me there. So.